So my name is Steven Annan. I work at Archetype Brewing Company. I'm the co-founder and head brewer here. We specialize in Belgian style beers, uh, mixed culture beers. So we do a lot of mixed culture fermentations with multiple yeast strains, uh, including a lot of Britannomyces. Um, we do rotating IPA series. We're currently working on a rotating lager series, uh, as well as some extended aged, uh, barrel aged Belgian style beers. We usually look for a need um, in our offerings. So we try to keep a balanced portfolio of our beers. Um, it, that also is kind of paired with what we like to drink, what we know consumers um, prefer to drink. We do our best to not just try to chase trends. Um, so we feel like really pushing the, the mixed culture beers is helping us stand out in the market. I initially wanted to get into brewing during my time out in Colorado. My wife and I lived out there uh, about six years ago. We lived in the Front Range, so Fort Collins and Denver, which is pretty much a mecca in the, in the beer world. So I went out there not really knowing what craft beer was, and being immersed in that culture made me appreciate it a lot more. So we ended up moving down south in Colorado to Durango, and I was offered a job at Ska Brewing Company. Um, I, I had actually never home brewed a batch of beer before I started working there. So I started as a cellarman. Um, so my job there included uh, filtration, um, centrifuging beer, just cellaring beer, bright beer management, et cetera. And that was about six years ago. Uh, and we moved to Asheville about f almost five years ago. I worked for a local brewery in town for about two and a half years before we decided to branch off and, and uh, do this archetype project. So we decided on starting brewery in Asheville because of the beer culture that already existed here. So we had a lot of contacts um, in the industry in town already. And we, we also felt like there was a market need, not necessarily for more beer, but a, but a different style of beer. There aren't a lot of people doing mixed culture beers here or Belgian style or Belgian inspired beers. So we felt like uh, that could be our niche. And we, so we really just kind of went after it. I was a literary nerd in high school and college. We chose Archetype because we felt like it left our branding wide open. Um, just the nature of archetypes, there are literally infinite amounts. So we could kind of go any direction with this. And as far as the beer names go, those are actually tropes. So we, we're sticking with the trope theme to kind of make uh, the archetype name a little bit more culturally um, relevant, I guess is the word. Archetype Brewing is located in West Asheville on Beecham's Curve. So this was kind of a historic area of West Asheville. Uh, back in the day, West Asheville was actually its own town separate from Asheville and there was a trolley line that ran around this corner and it was known as Beecham's Curve. So this is a relatively newly developed area in town that's kind of blown up. So uh, we have a lot of construction going on around us right now. So you're going to see uh, more retail shops, restaurants, etc. So this area is really up and coming. So today we're going to be talking about the use of non-barley adjuncts in brewing and how we use them here at Archetype uh, to create a little bit more complexity and depth to our beers. So we'll be going over both cereal grains and additional sugar sources. Um, and hopefully by the end of this, it'll shed some light on how to select those ingredients and use them to improve your beer. So I wanted to start by talking about the non-barley cereal grains that we use at Archetype uh, to build our recipes, specifically wheat, oats, and rye. And I'm gonna start first with wheat because it's the most widely available non-barley grain out in the market and there are um, a significant amount of options out there. So I wanted to dive into the different options, how to use them, and um, what to look for as far as um, flavor profile, usage rates, etc. So the main physical differences between wheat and barley is that in a process form, wheat typically um, has no husk, which is different than barley, which has a husk, which um, does pose some problems with um, with actually brewing with wheat. It's also uh, low in lipids and cellulose and it's high in protein. So I'm gonna start with malted wheat. Uh, malted wheat is wheat that has gone through the malting process, meaning it's uh, been partially germinated and then the germination is halted via hot air uh, to produce a product that has really good diastatic power, meaning that it possesses um, enough enzymatic activity to convert its own sugars. So it's really good to, to use in brewing um, because the diastatic power is so high in malted wheat, you can actually use that in conjunction with um, unmalted grains uh, to access those sugars in those particular grains. 
Um, in malted wheat, you do have an elevated protein content compared to barley, um, meaning in smaller amounts, you're going to have, uh, you're going to be able to add this into your, into your grain bill to affect head retention and to add body without, uh, without contributing too much to the mouthfeel. So it's really good for increasing your body while still maintaining kind of a lighter profile. Um, it's also good, again, at lower percentages to affect head retention. So let's start with milling for process considerations for malted wheat. So um, wheat kernels are actually going to be quite a bit smaller than barley kernels, meaning if you're using malted wheat or any type of wheat that's not flaked in your grain bill, you're going to have to adjust down your mill. This does pose some problems on a large production scale because we're going to have we're going to have to adjust our mill during grain in. Um, so as you can see, no hole on the on the berry, um, and it is smaller in size as well. Another process consideration for using wheat in your recipes is elevated protein content. So when you have elevated protein content, it's going to affect your ability to lauder your wort. Um, so one consideration is if you're if you're over 30 percent wheat in a grain bill is to do a protein rest. I typically do about 130 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 to 30 minutes and then ramp up to your sacrification rest temperatures. So what a protein rest does is it activates your protein enzymes um, that's, that are actually in the grains and allows those to unlock your longer chain proteins into smaller particles which decreases the viscosity of your wort. Uh, so what happens when your, your wort viscosity increases, your laudering uh, becomes more difficult. And when it decreases, your laudering becomes a little bit easier. So hitting those protein temperature rests um, improves your, your ability to lauder your wort significantly. So for malted wheat um, usage recommendations, if you're looking for uh, head retention impact or body impact, I normally use anywhere from 5 to 20% in a recipe. We do have a wit beer in which we use about 60% wheat that's split between malted wheat and flaked wheat. Um, if you're looking for just max usage, really want to get that wheaty flavor, um, I wouldn't really recommend going over 60%. You can do 100%. I've personally never done it, but um, there are a lot of process considerations when, when you elevate the amount of wheat in your mash. So let's talk about using unmalted wheat or raw wheat. So similarly to malted wheat, you're going to get a, a grain that has no husk, smaller in kernel size, so um, closing that mill gap a little bit if you are using this product. Um, the difference between the two, unmalted and malted, is um, the micronutrients in, in the grain are harder to access because it hasn't been partially germinated. So when using unmalted wheat, you want to make sure that you're pairing that with a grain that has high diastatic power. Um, so if you're using high levels of raw wheat, it's recommended to pair that with either six row, which has superior diastatic power than two row base malt, or um, just a, a high enough ratio of a base malt that will, that will convert all of the sugars in your raw wheat. So process considerations when using raw wheat is that it offers no enzymes or enzymatic activity. Um, so making sure that you hit maybe even a longer protein rest, so again at around 130 to 135 degrees Fahrenheit, will really unlock um, those micronutrients and uh, give you the ability to lauder successfully, as well as uh, increasing your extraction when using raw wheat. Um, so usage rates, when we, when we use raw wheat here, I typically stay below about 30%. Um, 5% to 10% can positively impact your head retention and your body. Um, anywhere beyond that, and you will start to get more of a grainy flavor than malted wheat, whereas malted wheat offers more of like a traditional wheat type of flavor to it. So the next type of wheat we're going to talk about is torrefied wheat. Torrified wheat is essentially a raw wheat kernel that has been heat treated, um, but still needs to be milled. So it's not flaked, it's not rolled, um, and it's not fully malted. So when you use that in your recipes, um, 
you do have quick conversion because those nutrients are, are accessible more so than raw wheat, but it also offers no diastatic power. So you're kind of limited as, um, as far as the ratio you can use in any given grain bill. With torrefied wheat, um, again, you're able to impact head retention and body without really imparting any sort of noticeable wheat flavor. So this can kind of be used similarly to dextrin malt, like carafoam or carapils. Um, but in instead of barley, you're using wheat. Process considerations for torrefied wheat would be, um, it's a lot easier to lauder than raw wheat. So typically I will sub torrefied wheat in for raw wheat if it's under that 25 to 30% mark. Um, but you do still have to mill it. So that is a consideration when using torrefied wheat over flaked wheat. Max usage rates for torrefied again are around 25 to 30%. To impact uh, head and body, I typically land between five and 10%. Flaked wheat is probably the most readily available form of wheat from uh, let's say a homebrew shop. Uh, flaked wheat is beneficial um, when using it in grain bills. It can be subbed out for raw wheat, malted wheat, or torrefied wheat. So what flaked wheat is, is it's a wheat kernel that is steamed and then rolled, which kind of gives it that uh, kind of gives it that that flattened flattened look. And when they steam and roll it, it is actually partially heat treated, so it is pre gelatinized. So you're not having to hit those really low temperature um, step mashes when you're using flaked wheat. Some process considerations with flaked wheat are that you don't have to mill it, so you can add this directly to your mash. So it's a little bit easier to handle than uh, torrefied wheat or raw wheat or even malted wheat. It, it is um, pre-gelatinized, so laudering is not as hard when you're using flaked wheat. You do get a strong kind of grainy flavor from using flaked wheat over some of these other wheat options. Usage rates for flaked wheat, head retention and body impact, normally around five to 15%. Um, anything beyond that, I would say max usage is probably about 40%. And I normally pair flaked wheat, again, with malted wheat or some other type of non-barley grain. Let's talk about some wheat takeaways. So if you're using wheat to uh, create kind of a hazy body for your beer, which is becoming more and more popular these days, I typically land around 15 to 20% max. Anything beyond that, so your 30 to 40% range, and because of the elevated protein content, uh, the particles become too heavy in suspension and it's, it's actually counterintuitive to creating a stable haze and it will drop out. It'll actually be less hazy than if you were to use a smaller amount um, in your grain bill. Uh, some more takeaways, using flaked wheat and malted wheat, probably more beneficial and a little bit easier than trying to handle torrefied wheat and raw wheat. Let's talk about using oats in brewing. So some physical differences between oats and barley are um, oats are high in beta-glucans and proteins. Um, and from a supply chain standpoint, there's really not as many options uh, in the market for different varieties of oats compared to barley or even wheat. Um, so in the market, you're probably gonna see flaked oats more prevalently than any other type. Um, you might run into some malted oats or even oat groats, um, but using them kind of provide kind of provide some process issues that flaked oats don't. But we'll go ahead and talk about each of these individually. Let's talk about the first form of oats available to us in brewing. That would be malted oats. So malted oats are oats that have been through the malting process. So again, partially germinated and then halted to produce a product that has diastatic power. So it's able to convert itself in a mash. It does also have elevated protein content, beta-glucan content, and um, high gum fractions. Some process considerations for malted oats is that you'll end up with a wort that has very high viscosity and a lot of turbidity or particulate in suspension, meaning that it's harder to lauder and it's also harder to clarify which, are, which work together with each other. Another process consideration for malted oats is the elevated beta-glucan content and protein content. So when using this, it is beneficial to do a step mash um, and start at a beta-glucan rest, which we typically use about 113 degrees Fahrenheit 
and then ramp up to a protein rest again around 130 to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And what that does is that it activates a few different enzymes um, to, give it to, to give those enzymes the chance to break down those nutrients to make them as accessible for brewer's yeast. Uh, this improves uh, wort clarity, improves laudering, and adds lipids to your wort that improves head retention and body. Usage rates for malted oats, typically for head retention and uh, body impact, I use anywhere between 5% and 20%. Anything beyond that and you start to create an unstable haze or laudering issues. Uh, there are people out there that have done 100% malted oat mashes. I personally have never tried this. If you are to do that, just make sure you're using uh, plenty of rice holes so you can have a successful lauder and runoff. The next form of oats we're going to talk about are oat groats. Uh, these are actually really hard to find, but if you are able to find them, they are essentially raw oats that don't have a husk or a hole. Um, so process, uh, process considerations for using oat groats would be that they don't have any diastatic power because they haven't been malted. Um, and they also are very high in beta-glucan, so you're going to essentially have to, have to use rice holes in order to use oat groats successfully. Oat groats offer a grainier flavor than flaked oats or malted oats. So if you're looking to create a more rustic oat-based beer um, or farmhouse ale, oat groats are the way to go if you can get your hands on them. Um, if you are using them above, let's say, 15 to 20% of the grain bill, it is beneficial to do a separate cereal mash, which is a totally separate mash from your, your main uh, grain mash, in which you combine um, your, your total amount of oat groats weight-wise with 30% of a base malt. So uh, it's beneficial to, to pair it with uh, six-row malt, which has high diastatic, diastatic power. So 30% base malt to uh, your total weight of oat groats will, um, will, will give you a successful cereal mash Then you can then add into your main mash. Usage rates for oat groats would be um, for body and mouth feel, anywhere from 5 to 20%. For head retention, 10% is kind of a magic number. Max usage rates, I wouldn't go over 40%. Um, there, there is a correlation between increased um, oat percentage in a grain bill and decreased, uh, decreased head retention. So anything above 20% and you, you might start running into issues with head retention from uh, high oat content. Let's talk about flaked oats. Flaked oats are probably the most av readily available form of oats from a homebrew shop. Um, so, but similarly to malted oats and raw oats, you are going to run into the same issues with increased beta-glucan content and protein content. So it's best to, to do a step mash if you're using high percentage of flaked oats as well. Um, a process consideration for flaked oats is that you don't have to mill them, so you can add them directly to your mash. This makes it a little bit easier to use oats in a mash because you don't have to adjust your mill settings before you use them. Flaked oats are pre-gelatinized, so like flaked wheat, they are steamed and rolled. So those micronutrients are more readily accessible um, to the enzymes in the mash. Usage rates for flaked oats, um, 5 to 20% for body and mouthfeel. Again, 10% for head retention. And I would max out at about 40% of your grain bill with flaked oats. Some oat takeaways would include using flaked oats in place of uh, oat groats or raw oats or even malted oats. They are easier to handle. You don't have to mill them, and you can use them to the same degree that you would use uh, raw or malted oats. Malted oats can be used at a rate of 100% of your grain bill, uh, but you will see a decrease in overall fermentability when compared to 100% barley mash. Um, it's also recommended, again, to keep the, the percentage of oats in your grist down to around 18 to 20% if you're looking for um, body and mouthfeel impact without uh, head retention de uh, degradation. Another note on usage rates with oats, anywhere from 5 to 10% of your grain bill, um, and you'll see a decrease in lag, your lag phase um, during your fermentation, so you'll have a quicker turnaround with fermentation. There's also a correlation between a high percentage of oats and a drop in certain off flavors. So if you're between 40 and 100% of your grain bill being oats, um, there, there are a couple studies that suggest that you'll see lower levels of DMS and other sulfur compounds as well as acetaldehyde. Let's talk about using rye in beer. 
Um, so first we'll talk about the physical differences between rye and barley. So the kernels are actually thinner and longer than barley. Um, they do have a softer endosperm. So sometimes, um, it's a little anecdotal, but sometimes people reported these kernels as being not as friable. Friability is um, a particle's ability to be, essentially to be cracked into different pieces instead of just kind of mushed. Um, higher beta-glucan content, which can, uh, which can affect your ability to water. So kind of, kind of the same types of issues that we run into oats when we're using this in brewing. Let's first talk about malted rye. So with malted rye, uh, it's rye that's been through the malting process. So it has a little bit of diastatic power. Uh, it does not have a hole when it shows up. It's probably the most readily available form of rye for brewing from homebrew shops. Um, and again, some have reported that it has lower friability. So that can be a little bit of an issue with milling. Um, and on the note of milling, you are going to have to really close that gap on your mill as, um, as the kernels are very thin and long. Um, process considerations for using malted rye. Uh, higher beta-glucan content, so hitting that, um, that beta-glucan rest of about 113 degrees Fahrenheit for about 15 minutes really helps with your wort viscosity and improves laudering. Um, if you don't do that, you're probably going have to have to use uh, rice holes. Anything above 15%, I would recommend using rice holes regardless of doing a step mash or a single infusion mash. Uses rates for malted rye would include um, head retention and, and body impact being anywhere between 5 and 15% of your total grain bill. If you're really looking to impart that spicy, earthy rye quality, uh, 15 plus percent is recommended. Wouldn't go over 60% as you're going to run into huge laudering issues and um, low extraction. And make sure to use rice holes if you're going anywhere above 20 to 25%. Rye does pair well traditionally with a lot of, um, with a lot of IPA type flavor profile. So uh, if, you're, if you're looking to do a really spicy rye IPA, I would shoot for about 25% malted rye. Let's talk about using flaked rye in your mashes. So flaked rye is uh, pre-gelatinized. Um, similarly to flaked wheat or flaked oats or even flaked barley. So it is steamed and rolled um, just like those other grains. Um, if you are using flaked rye, you don't have to mill. You can add directly to your mash. Um, laudering is a little bit easier than using raw or malted rye. Uh, when using flaked rye, there's no need to do a beta-glucan rest because it is pre-gelatinized. So you're not going to run into uh, a really thick gummy mash when using flaked rye. Usage rates for flaked rye, anywhere from 5 to 15% for head retention and improved body. Um, any, any sort of spicy rye quality, again, aim for that you know, 15 to 25, 35% number. Uh, recommended max usage for flaked rye would be around 40%. And again, multi-step mashes um, for any sort of rye does improve laudering, as well as the addition of rice hulls. Some rye takeaways, um, to get a better understanding of the flavor that rye um, puts into beer, it's recommended to start at a low percentage, so maybe five to 10%, and then subsequently increase batch to batch if you're really looking to bring out that spicy, earthy rye uh, quality. Flaked rye is probably the easiest to use, um, even when compared to malted rye, as you don't have to adjust your mill. Anecdotally, uh, malted rye has a stronger rye flavor than flaked rye. So if you are looking for that really spicy, earthy quality, um, opt for malted rye as opposed to flaked. So we're going to talk about how we use this information and apply this at, um, at our brewery, Archetype. Um, so specifically, we're going to talk about our Belgian wit beer, which is kind of one of our staples. So in our wit beer, 60% of the grain bill is, uh, is wheat. So we do kind of a split between malted wheat and flaked wheat. Uh, we have done renditions with raw wheat, but it, it did give us a little bit of trouble with laudering. So from a production standpoint, we've we moved to uh, malted wheat and flaked wheat in our wit beer, uh, which allows us to still impart that, that kind of a grainy sweetness from, from wheat into this wit beer, um, but allows us to produce this on a larger scale without causing multiple issues during that process. So the end result in our wit beer of using this 60% split um, of wheat is that we're left with a fairly dry, uh, fairly dry beer, which is pretty traditional for a wit beer, but we do have a little bit of that perceived sweetness, and that comes from using a high amount of uh, wheat in this beer. 
And it also has a very light body, but it's still a little bit chewy, uh, which kind of sounds like a contradiction. But again, using, using those ratios of wheat in this beer um, gives, us, gives us the end result that we were looking for. If you're looking to produce a, a really rustic wit beer, um, you could try using up to 50% raw wheat and using a base of either six row or another um, high diastatic power base malt. Um, and what that would do on a small scale is it would, it would allow you to still lauder with the addition of rice holes and get that really rustic wheat flavor uh, while positively impacting the body, head retention, and leaving you with a pretty traditional Belgian wit. So for our, our mixed culture beers, so anything that's seeing multiple yeast strains or non-traditional brewing yeast like Britannomyces, um, we typically use a lot of these adjuncts, specifically um, a lot of raw adjuncts. What this does is um, we, we get adequate extract, but we do get a lot of unfermentables when, when talking about brewing yeast. So if we're doing kind of a, uh, primary and secondary fermentation with multiple yeast strains. It allows our brewing yeast to, to rip through the sugars, the fermentable sugars that are in solution, but it leaves behind these unfermentables, uh, which allows us to pitch bread and it, it gives Britannomyces a lot to chew on. And what that does down the road is it, it gives us more time, um, gives us more time, more opportunity to, to produce a, a bolder Brett profile. Uh, we found that if there's not a lot of unfermentables uh, in solution after primary fermentation with, with a Saccharomyces strain, um, the bread profile is pretty muted after we pitch it. So if you're looking to produce really funky saisons or, or um, really, really funky farmhouse beers that have a lot of character, um, it is beneficial to use raw grains in your mash. Um, knowing that it, it might affect your laudering ability and it might affect your extract, but down the line you're going to have a stronger Brett profile. When thinking about unfermentables and fermentable sugars in your wort, um, when doing a mixed culture beer, there's really no golden ratio as far as where to land on your final gravity for your primary fermentation. Um, if you're left with a lot, it's just going to take a little bit longer for Britannomyces to chew through those, um, those sugars. So what happens when you have a lot of unfermentables in your wort um, post primary terminal fermentation is uh, when you pitch Brett, uh, Brett has the ability to unlock these longer chain sugars and compounds that are in your wort that normal Saccharomyces strains can't. So when it does that, it's producing more and more flavor compounds and aroma compounds. Um, so essentially the more you give it to chew on post primary fermentation, the more uh, flavor impact it's going to have. So leaving some residual unfermentables is beneficial when using, um, when using a mixed culture uh, yeast strain for, for your beers. So if you're looking for more Brett exp expression, um, try to leave behind more unfermentables. So you can either do that by adding more raw grains, you can mash um, pretty hot 158 to 160 Fahrenheit. Um, if you're looking for more of a muted Brett profile, you can either do 100% Brett fermentation, which again, sounds like a contradiction, but it actually produces a more mild uh, Brett profile, as opposed to pitching with a sack strain, letting that finish out, hit terminal with some residual sugars remaining, and then pitching Brett and, and letting that do its thing to produce these um, Brett compounds. We do a lot of Saisons at Archetype. Um, that just happens to, to fall in line with our uh, Belgian influence. When we do saisons and we're kind of formulating uh, recipes and grain bills, we really look towards the end result. So what, what type of flavor profile are we after? Are we looking for uh, more of a, an earthy profile? Are we looking for more of like a spicy profile? Um, is it a mixed culture saison? How many yeast strains are going into it? Um, and a sa saisons are, are big on the whole uh, terroir thing that's that's a little buzzy right now um, so with our saisons we do try to use a lot of local ingredients um, so we we end up using a lot of local malts from a uh, local maltster in town riverbend malting i don't know if i could plug them or not but i just did so again so we, we kind of look at we look towards the end when we're trying to formulate a grain bill so if we're, if we're really wanting a spicy like clovey saison we're probably going to use 
15 to 30 percent rye in that particular saison. If we're doing a mixed culture saison, we want that spicy, funky profile, then we'll use raw rye and we'll sub that in for any sort of flaked or malted rye. And that'll allow us to carry over some unfermentables for the Brett to chew on uh, while still giving us that spicy, earthy quality that we're looking for. Using wheat in saisons um, pairs well with, with the, uh, the, the earthy um, profile that saison strains put out during fermentation. Um, so we do use a lot of wheat as well. And we will, we will interchange raw wheat, uh, malted wheat, and flaked. Typically, we use a lot of uh, flaked and malted wheat in our saisons as well. Another benefit of using wheat, oats, and rye in your saisons is head retention and body. So saisons by nature are, are bone dry, or in my opinion, they should be. Um, and when you think of a kind of a classic like farmhouse saison, you think of a big billowing, like really sturdy, rocky head on that beer. So when you use these non-barley grains in, in your grain bills, what you're left with is a higher protein content on the back end. So you have, um, you have more of a rigid structure to your head retention. So you, you're, you end up with greater head retention that paired with elevated CO2 levels in saisons um, creates just kind of a, a beautiful presentation for, for these beers. This beer is Timely Surrender. Um, this is our Brett Saison. This is uh, a beer we use 100% local grains for. So we use Riverbend malt. Um, we do use 20% malted wheat in this beer. And that was a deliberate choice. Uh, we knew this beer was gonna get bone dry uh, because it saw two different fermentations. So we were planning on primary fermentation with the Saison strain, secondary with the Brett Brux strain. Um, we knew, given the time, it was going to hit almost 100% almost attenuation. So to balance out that dryness, uh, we decided to up the percentage of wheat in this beer to 20%. And that, again, does two things. Um, it helps balance out the body, gives a little bit of chewiness, and it also helps strengthen uh, the head retention. So we have really good head retention on this beer. And then the decision to use all all local malt for this beer kind of goes back to that terroir thing with saisons. Uh, we felt like this beer was a really good representation of what local malsters are doing in our area and then in turn what we're able to do with these malts as brewers. So this is our Brett IPA, um, Nameless Light is the name. <coughs> um, we use 10% rye malt in this beer. Um, so this is actually 100% Brett fermented beer. So. The culture we use is about five or six Brett strains in one slurry. Um, this beer takes about two to three months to produce, um, nearly 100% attenuation. And the reason we added rye malt in this beer um, at 10% was, again, to help balance out that dryness um, and strengthen that head retention. Uh, we also knew that <coughs> going into this that the rye malt was going to impart um, some spicy qualities that would pair well with the Chinook we use in the dry hop, as well as um, the flavor profile that the Brett was going to put out. So the decision to um, use multiple Brett strains in this beer was to address the issue of some Brett strains not being able to, to ferment maltose, which makes up the bulk of the sugar composition in, in uh, most warts. So when we do that, we're, we're ensuring that we get full attenuation and full fermentation. Um, we're also layering in, um, layering in complexity and depth to this beer by using multiple Brett strains in different, uh, totally different styles of Brett strains. So there's a few Brett Bruck strains in there. There's a Claw Cine strain in there as well. Um, there's even a, a Brett Nana strain in here. Um, so again, to reiterate, we're addressing the problem of some strains not being able to fer fully ferment um, a wort for primary fermentation and um, it does help on the back end to just make a more complex beer. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about non-cereal grain based sugar sources. So the ones we use at Archetype uh, primarily are dextrose, which is chemically identical to glucose. Sometimes it's sold as uh, corn sugar and candy syrup, which depending on the manufacturer um, can be an invert sugar. Dextrose is a simple sugar that's derived from corn. It's chemically identical to glucose. Um, we primarily use it hot side during wort production, and we use it in, in the boil. Uh, we typically, we, we add it at the 60 minute addition. Um, I would recommend not adding it um, with, with any less time than 20 minutes left in your boil to ensure that it's sterile. 
Uh, when we use it, we use it primarily for gravity adjustments. So if we're making if we're making multiple batches of a beer and we're trying to hit our target gravities and we're under uh, we're under gravity, we can use dextrose to compensate that. Uh, we also have it built into certain recipes to um, increase the ABV without increasing the body. So we're, what we're essentially doing is we're increasing the amount of fermentable sugars in the wort without increasing unfermentables. So it allows us to maintain a light body but increase ABVs for some of these higher ABV beers. We also use dextrose uh, at Archetype for priming sugar. So anything that's bottle conditioned, uh, we, use, uh, we use dextrose to prime the beer before we bottle it. So we bottle our beer still, totally still. Um, everything that goes into bottles is, as right now, is uh, barrel aged. So we're looking at um, relatively zero CO2 in solution. So that factors into how much sugar and yeast we're priming in the beer before we bottle it. Um, so those are the two instances that we use dextrose in our brewery. So adding dextrose in the boil to create a drier beer kind of seems counterintuitive, but because it's 100% fermentable and, and easily accessible by Saccharomyces strains, um, it actually produces a drier beer in the end without, um, without beefing up the body at all. Because we are Belgian inspired at Archetype, uh, we do use a lot of candy syrup. And the candy syrup we do source is, is processed only with heat. So it is technically an invert, uh, an invert sugar. So what happens when, um, when you invert a sugar molecule, you're taking sucrose and it splits into glucose and fructose, which is more readily accessible uh, by brewer's yeast. So uh, the fermentability of candy syrup is pretty close to 100%. Um, we do use it both hot side and cold side, so wort production and during fermentation. I've seen better flavor development and better um, flavor contribution using it cold side. A lot of these compounds in invert sugar or candy syrup uh, like to volatilize during a boil, so you lose some of those compounds when you add them into your boil. So if you're going to add this in cold side, just assure that the manufacturer has packaged it aseptically so you're not infecting your beer. Candy syrup actually comes in a pretty big range of colors. So darker colors have been heated for a longer period of time. And essentially what's producing that flavor is a uh, Maillard reaction. So um, it's a combination of sugar and, uh, and amino acid molecules um, via heat produces these flavor compounds. So essentially the darker the syrup, the heavier the flavor. So you can get Belgian candy syrups that um, essentially are pretty close to simple syrups. Uh, simple syrup is sugar and water, so it's not an invert sugar. Uh, but when it's processed via heat, even if it's for a short period of time, it becomes slightly inverted. Um, we don't use a lot of lighter candy syrups. It's honestly more beneficial to use dextrose if you're using it hot side just for um, ABV um, contribution. So if you're looking for flavor contribution, aim for more of the dark um, candy syrups or rock candy or candy sugar. So historically, uh, Belgian candy syrup is produced from beets or beet sugar, uh, which does impart a certain flavor that may be different from using other sugar sources to make invert syrup. Uh, it's also not recommended to go above 20 to 25% by weight in your beer. Uh, what that does, especially with cold side additions, is it's adding so many simple sugars that the yeast um, the yeast accesses those, sim those simple sugars first, ferments through all of those, and if there's very little more complex sugars remaining, some of that yeast that um, used a lot of its energy to burn through these simple sugars won't start producing the enzymes to break down these longer chain sugars to a point where they're fermentable. So candy syrup additions over 20 to 25% can be counterproductive to healthy yeast performance and fermentation. Thank you guys for watching. If you would like to find out more about Archetype, check us out at archetypebrewing.com or the Instagram and Facebook handles at Archetype Brewing AVL.